So thank you all for being here. Uh, we are beginning with the first talk of a series of talks that will happen on 29th of November, 13th of December, 20th of December, and 10th of January 2024. With this, I would request Professor Vishnu Mohapatra, the director of the center, to please share your thoughts with us. Thank you, Mumtaz. I think uh, it will be a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to yet another uh, seminar uh, that we do on the part of the Motor Relief Satyanarayan Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences. And uh, we have been doing it since last term. And uh, the last term, I think you remember that our theme was largely on labor and that so on. We, were, uh, we have received very good feedback uh, from people who came to uh, listen to various speakers who came and spoke on the theme of labor and city. And this time we don't have one theme, but there's only one similarity. This coming round of talks are largely uh, by the Motor Use of the Center fellows. So today we have uh, Arun to speak to us, uh, and uh, we would have uh, five talks coming up, including this one. Uh, largely internal uh, members of the center, and I hope uh, that we will be able to uh, organize uh, more uh, in the coming months. And, and, and thank you once again for uh, joining us, even all the colleagues who are uh, joining us online. I extend my warm welcome to you all. And with us. Thank you, Professor Mahapatra. So, dear friends, I will introduce our first speaker of today's talk to you. Our speaker, Dr. P. Arun, holds a PhD in Political Science from the University of Delhi. His doctoral research explores the history of telegraph and telephone surveillance and its concomitant effects on fundamental rights and freedoms in liberal democracies. Dr. Arun is currently working to turn his doctoral thesis into a book. So, with this brief introduction of our today's talk speaker, I would request you, Dr. P. Haru, please continue with your talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Muntaz. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. It's indeed a pleasure to present my work in this series of talks with my co-fellows. Uh, since this is a working paper, I would uh, request everyone to feel free to ask any sort of questions or offer any kind of suggestions uh, and comments. I am saying this because uh, for any research scholar, questions, suggestions and comments are essential food for thought. Uh, now let me just jump into my presentation. I believe everyone who were present, you might have read the telegrams running in the video loop. So, in the first few minutes, uh, I will briefly talk about Telegraph and in the rest, I will discuss about how noises made it difficult to communicate signals. In this hall, there might be very few people who might have an experience of sending and receiving telegrams. Telegraph was the first wired means of communications and the messages sent via Telegraph was called Telegram. And or even cablegram or radiogram. The message is short with 15 to 30 words. Long telegrams can be sent, but it would be really expensive. Uh, and they are usually used by the press and journalists as they hold yearly subscriptions. I would say telegram might sound like sending SMSs uh, in telegraph era, but there is a catch. The sender would disclose the message to the telegraph authority in order to send it. 
many may not understand what it means. Sir. If I ask everyone in this hall to send their messages in WhatsApp or Gmail to the government authority, everyone would feel uncomfortable. Why I would share it to the government to send them my message? So, in Telegraph era, privacy over telegrams is not possible due to operational non-feasibility or absence of robust legal protection, what we have today. So, when I am saying operational non-feasibility, I mean the message is not private because it is read numerous times by the telegraph authorities to send and receive messages and even retained for functional purposes. So, therefore, Telegraph surveillance is quite different compared to telephone or cellular or internet surveillance. Now, if we look into history, humans were constantly making innovations for long distance communication. The telegraph communication was a major innovation, emerged in 1840s and grown rapidly later on. It becomes important to understand the significance and consequences of instantaneous and rapid communication. For the modern state, it became significant to extend its power over vast territorial distance. It served as a potent force for expansion, maintenance and administration of empire. In the context of imperial governance, there is a popular phrase, the empire on which the sun never sets. This phrase reflects the reach of British empire and its vast territorial control, but how it became possible? It became possible with the invention of telegraph communication. Uh, by end of the century, the Britishers had encircled the entire world, with telegraph holding absolute control over the flow of information. So here you could see in this slide, uh, the map with red lines indicating both underwater submarine cables and overland cables, interconnecting many parts of the world. When we look at United Kingdom particularly, we can see that there are many cables chiefly because it served as a central node. In India, telegraph was introduced by Britishers in 1851. Uh, the first British telegraph was laid between uh, Calcutta and Diamond Harbour. In the following years, large-scale construction led to connecting major administrative parts, as you could see in this slide, of telegraph network in 1855. The network expanded from 6,840 kilometers in 1857 to 1,88,600 kilometers in 1947. And the presence of telegraph during British Empire had primarily reshaped the colonial rule by facilitating means for expansion and control. So Lord Dalhousie called it as engine of power, from whose position the government could derive immense political and military advantages. An American historian Daniel Hedrick argued that the presence of telegraph in the colony was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it gave an advantage to the colonial state, but on the other hand, it undermined uh, British rule instead of making it permanent. The rapid flow of ideas and information allowed Indians to mobilize, unite in their resistance, protest, national struggle. It had enhanced their ability to communicate throughout the subcontinent and even overseas. With the colonial state holding control over the telegraph communication and their ability to the ability to intercept, monitor and censor telegram, the question which really bothers me is how do we understand surveillance power exercised by the colonial state in British India? Instead of taking a convenient route to argue that the colonial state was monitoring and censoring telegraph communication of the colonial subjects and anti-colonialists, I try to understand telegraph surveillance through a conceptual framework of surveillance studies and media studies. A noted media anthropologist Brian Larkin in his book Signal and Noise holds that the capacity of media technologies transmitting message is signal and the prevention of those transmitted uh, signals due to technical interference is noise. In the case of telegraph in colonial India, those who intend to send their messages were subject to, uh, were subject to interception and monitoring. But this, these subjects were minded forms of surveillance noises, what I am arguing which disrupt the information carried out by the signal and thus hampering the communication. Here the flow of signals are subject to the predisposition of the colonial state due to their position and their control over the channel. It thus grants the colonial state a master switch. 
uh, to introduce different forms of surveillance noises that were not part of the telegraph signals during the transmission but were introduced in between. Now, if we contextualize the late colonial period, roughly around 1910 to 1940, it was the active phase of freedom movement and the trade union movement. During this period, telegraph signals turned out as a mainstay for rapid uh, internal and overseas communication. It was actively used to connect, unite and mobilize themselves uh, to instantly share updates across the country and overseas, share information about arrests and brutalities committed by the police. It provided instantaneous means to connect and remain in touch with each other despite being located in distant time and space. But the surveillance noises hampered it and Jawaharlal Nehru expressed it as difficulty to be in touch in different places. To conceptually understand these surveillance noises, I follow the conceptual framework of British imperial emotions as articulated by a different set of scholars, Robert Peckman, Mark Pondo, C.A. Perry, D.K.L. Chaudhary and many more. Uh, the most recent tradition being Javed Iqbal Wani's uh, sovereign anxiety. The colonial state was constantly disturbed by these uh, telegraph signals as they were held objectionable, alarming, seditious, anti-colonial. It thus led to denying and undermining the utilities of telegraph by inducing surveillance noises to forestall the course of collective brain, resisting or uniting against them. According to me, the excessive utilization of surveillance noises was primarily due to the reaction toward their anxiety, fear and panic as these telegraph signals challenged their colonial claims to sovereignty and questioned their authority to rule India. The excessive utilization of surveillance noises must be contextualized in late colonial India as they reflect the repression uh, to preserve autocracy besides the ongoing conciliation. Though British were in the process of gaining self-government, but the progress was gradual and during this interim period, British wanted to retain control. Here, surveillance noises served as a viable tool to control, manage and block telegraph signals, vigorously carrying out political activities and political ambitions aiming to attain self-government. To understand the position and power of the colonial state over telegraph, which gave the master switch to introduce different forms of surveillance noises, we must look into the legal regime. So the surveillance power were granted under the section 5 of the Indian Telegraph Act. It offers different forms of surveillance power to the government, which include prohibiting transmission, uh, worded as not to be transmitted, interception, detention, disclosure of telegrams to the government. These power can be exercised on the ground of public safety and public emergency. Besides telegraph law, there were rules under Indian Telegraph Rule 1927 and Indian Post and Telegraph Guide. These rules empower the telegraph authorities to refuse to accept for and or forward messages as they were considered as objectionable or alarming in nature. And if the telegraph authorities feels there is any doubt, they should refer to the civil and military authorities for clarification. Then there is Defense of India Rules 1939 which came during the Second World War uh, which gives the power to detain and paraphrase uh, telegrams. So, now with this power it is not just enough. You need to have a strategy how to uh, intercept and monitor those messages. So to obtain optimal uh, results there were diverse strategies to effectively utilize these surveillance noises. So first is discriminative targeting. Under this, noises were employed to target a list of persons and organizations including office, accommodation addresses, country origin, destination, anything like that. The second strategy is indiscriminative targeting. Under this, noises were employed to identify the message or class of messages to be intercepted, detained and examined irrespective of identity of the target. Now, it needs to be noted that all these measures were not completely efficient as the possibility of subjects evading telegraph surveillance always existed. Now, I will discuss particular episodes to validate my argument and I don't think I could, I could uh, share all the episodes due to the time constraints. 
But what I will do is share few episodes and thematically highlight against whom these powers were used. So, a telegram was sent by Lehi Artun in June 1917, following by the following the internment uh, of the popular leader of Home Rule Movement, Annie Besant, along with their associate George and Arundel and B.B. Vardya. The telegram was withheld by the deputy chief censor, who also sought information about the sender. Uh, while secretary of the Home Department called the language of the telegram is most objectionable. Now, question is who is Lekhi Arthun and why he sent this telegram? Mr. Arthun was a 40 year old man of Armenian descent whose chief interest was theosophy and he was blindly following Mrs. Ms. Besant. Professionally, he was a bank manager in Gwalior branch of Alliance Bank of Shimla. The government was offended by this content as it offered sympathy to Besant and her associates for their internment and sought Indian leaders to mark a protest, a strong protest by sending telegrams. Apart from criticizing the government decision by calling it as covertly un-British and unconstitutional action, he strongly advocated to extend home rule activity and her constitutional rights to retain the freedom snatched away from them. In 1916, Home Rule League was formed by Tilak and Besant and their ideas of self-government garnered momentum and subsequently alarmed the government to take action. In this case of a withheld telegram, the colonial state was disturbed by this telegraph signal employed to offer sympathy and support to Ms. Besant and her movement. The colonial state was disturbed with the growing admiration and support to the home rule movement. In this context, Mr. Arthur's telegraph signal offended colonial state and it was caught in the existing noise of censorship. In the following decades, surveillance noises will become a regular feature during the labor strikes, salt satyagra and national movements. During non-cooperation movement launched in 1920, the government employed indiscriminative targeting over telegrams. So telegrams dispatched by the promoters of non-cooperation movement were to be refused as they were objectionable, violent, seditious. This indiscriminative targeting was again employed during civil disobedience movement. On 6 March 1930, Gandhi broke salt law and followed by publicly declaring on 26 April 1930 to raid government controlled uh, salt bags in Harshana, present day in Gujarat. His declaration to raid uh, disturbed the colonial state, leading to his arrest on 5th May 1930 after much consideration, primarily to prevent the brain which guide the civil disobedience campaign, as said by the government official. However, they could not prevent the raid as it was carried out by the Gandhian comrades such as Saroji Naidu and others as you could see in the screen. Uh, prior to 5 5th May, the officials in Belgaum anticipating the possible arrest of Gandhi strongly believed that telegrams concerning Gandhi's arrest might cause disturbance. It was arguably the fear which led to closely monitor these messages. The ongoing civil disobedience campaign further led to intensify telegraph surveillance by extending the scope over all telegrams, not just of Gandhi's raid, uh, and supporting this campaign. Uh, these telegrams were believed to have a disturbing effect if allowed unchecked. Just five days prior to Gandhi's arrest, the Home Department issued the order to intercept all messages containing information about this proposed raid on the Darshana salt works uh, by Gandhi. In this slide, you could see this two surveillance order in the month of April 1930. In right side, right side, it is the general order as it targets any telegram, whereas in the left side, it is quite specific as it targets information about proposed by the Darshana raid by Gandhi. Uh, in 1927, League Against Imperialism was launched. With, the, with a goal to for international unity and solidarity among people and workers in colonized countries. In its decade-long existence, this international anti-colonial group was suspected of having communist affiliation 
and thus it remained under scrutiny in both Britain and India. It became more evident with the illustrative case of a telegram you are seeing in this slide. On 30 October 1935, Reginald Bretschmann, Secretary of the League Against Imperialism, Imperialism dispatched a tele greeting telegram on behalf of the League to the General Secretary of All India Press Workers Federation in Bombay. It was sent for the upcoming conference. It never reached the destination. Hence, he, few months later, sent a letter, Bridgman sent a letter to the Indian Secretary seeking redressal for the non-delivery of the telegram. This is not an isolated case. There were several messages which were withheld. Besides monitoring such messages of greet, fraternal greeting, surveillance message, measures were further extended over identifying links and connections of the people and organization affiliated to controlled by or connected to foreign trade union groups and communist groups and Hindustan Gadda Party. As per the list made in 1935, there were total 152 organizations. They were identified by their individual name, country origin, particular keywords such as international denoting to communist international economic trend. The people and organization associated with them were regarded as dangerous, undesirable characters and their sources were held as objectionable. A close, close watch was also kept over foreign remittance received through telegraph and postal money orders as they were called Bolshevik money, communist remittance. As you could see, the, uh, the director of intelligence bureau was apprehensive about the growing communist movement and he points out there is an increasing likelihood of money being sent into the country. A list of people whose telegrams and the telegraph money orders to be monitored were maintained. It includes more than 200 people such as Reginald Bridgman, M. N. Roy, Pulin Bihari C., Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, Sakhlatwala, Virendranath Chattopadhyaya and many more. The telegraph surveillance over people and organization must be understood in a context as why people and organizations are communicating. During 1920 and 30, colonial India witnessed massive labor upsurge, accompanied by communist penetration into trade unions and labor organization. During this period, the idea of communism and socialism became a popular creed and grew rapidly. These ideas emerged as an alternative, thus marked the entry of left bloc into the existing national movement. Their entry changed the political atmosphere and gave new direction to the fight of the rights for working class which was integrated with the goal of political independence. During this period, there were many labor strikes, demonstration. Now, in the context of telegraph signals, it allowed the working class movement in India to remain connected with the worldwide struggle of the working class. Here, the colonial state employed surveillance noises to hamper and preclude the telegraph signals aimed to forge solidarity. Till now, I have discussed two purposes for which the colonial state employed surveillance noises. The first is against colonial resistance such as strikes, protests and national movement. The second is over the links and connections of anti-colonialists. Now, the third one is against the information shared uh, telegraphically among people. On 6th February 1931, Modilal Nehru, the father of Jawaharlal Nehru, died at the age of 70 due to his deteriorating health. A month prior to his death, Gaya Prasad Singh uh, in legislative assembly raised questions whether the telegrams inquiring about the health of Mutilal Nehru in September 1930 were intercepted and withheld. If so, how many of them were withheld and why? In reply, the government admitted to withholding three telegrams in the month of September 1930 and no refund was given back to the senders. Based on this surveillance order, as everyone can see in this slide, telegrams of both from and to Motila Nehru were detained. So, just few months before his death, during August and September 1930, 28 telegrams sent from different provinces were stopped. This episode reflects the extent of control over the flow of information, which uh, regarded the telegram of Motilal Nehru's death as objectionable. I still believe there is something more behind this decision which I am yet to find. Then the telegram sharing information about uh, uh, 
information to foreign audience about police arrest and the repression they were also detained so madeline slee or mira ben popularly known as gandhi's adopted daughter sent telegrams to british labor mp tom williams american fascist fascist john hannes forms and expatriate french novelist roman roland were withheld as we could see one of this telegram to tom uh, williams sir during civil disobedience movement mira ben played a crucial role in a uh, systematic collection of news about prevailing condition in india and its widespread dissemination to international audience she assumed this role because the indian press was heavily censored she forwarded these newspapers uh, by a telegram to williams mentioning about uh, as you could see if it is clear uh, about the ordinance rule arrested political leaders and pressmen political bodies declared unlawful and so on the secretary of the state of for india called these messages as the propaganda against the government uh, a similar message telegram was delivered addressed to tom william was sent by gandhi's personal secretary mahadev desai it was also with help uh, mira ben and mahadev desai telegram to labor mp raised lot of questions both in legislative assembly here and in britain how do we understand this whole episode for me there are two major takeaways sir first surveillance noise was employed indiscriminately regardless of the identity and stature of the recipient despite being a british parliamentarian the second is labor mp tom williams and other parliamentarians articulated the members privilege with regard to correspondence but they also pointed out that surveillance noise over telegraph signals curtails not merely the sender's right to communicate but the overall intercommunication between sender and receiver the last lastly i will talk about episodes uh, of the surveillance noises over press telegrams which were often used by journalists to report important events Uh, the most notable incident is uh, Jallianwala Bagh massacre, 13 April 1919. Uh, the presence of telegraph was not helpful to communicate the news immediately within India and uh, in Britain. The strict censorship imposed control and stemmed news. It really took many months to get real picture of what happened in Jallianwala Bagh. When questions were raised in uh, British Parliament about censorship. British government responded that I quote wires are very much congested it may have been for that reason that none of this evidence was telegraphed now let's look to the second episode in may 1930 american correspondent ved miller was covering a peaceful demonstration in dharshana in gujarat but miller witnessed police authorities brutally attacking peaceful raiders after being an eyewitness of this Distressing event. He had to face the biggest hurdle uh, to get the story out of the world. To urgently forward this news about unresisting and unarmed satyagrahis being beaten up by armed police force in British India, he made use of the nearest telegraph facility in Balsa. But the telegrams were detained, and the message got delivered after Miller found a loophole in British censorship. as the news came out publicly around the world it shocked everyone as it exposed the british wheel of being civilized and being democratic uh, during civil disobedience movement uh, the colonial state strongly felt that the effective check must be kept on press telegrams according to british authorities indian press was engaged in supporting civil disobedience campaign which is as they called as a lawless movement as it was inculcating violent revolutionary ideas spreading seeds of disaffection against the colonial state through propaganda and seditious messages as you can see in this slide between 10 march to 1 may 1930 which is roughly the period of 53 days during uh, dandi march to dharshana day total 95 foreign and inland press telegrams were intercepted and followed by the decision to either detain or allow them in this table telegrams refer to one telegraph message but the recipients of that message are either one or many 
Except few related to diplomacy and foreign affairs, many telegrams were related to civil disobedience movement. So when I was going through all these 95 foreign inland and press telegrams, uh, the contents of these press telegrams showed a distinctive rationale behind government's action. And they were clearly evidence in these two instances I want to mention. By April 1930, the ongoing civil disobedience campaign had reached northwestern frontier province and it was fervently pursued by local nationalists. However, the British authorities employed brutal force to suppress this campaign uh, as evident in this Peshawar massacre. On 23rd April 1930, Peshawar witnessed the worst massacre, also called as Kisatwani Bazaar massacre. As official figures about people were killed and same number of injured, and but the actual numbers were five times larger than that. Now the thing is, uh, we need to look into the number of telegrams which I have tried to compare which telegrams were detained and allowed to go. So the violent suppression in Peshawar was followed by the calculative message uh, measures of switching on surveillance noises to suppress news revealing factual events and only permitting transmission of messages pertaining to violent acts by the demonstrators. As everyone can see this slide for comparison of the contents of the press telegrams on this Peshawar massacre, between 23rd and 29th April 1930, 19 press telegrams were intercepted pertaining to this measure, out of which 5 were detained and 14 were allowed. Now let's uh, go towards another instance. Uh, police brutality against Saul Satyagrahis. In April 1930, press telegrams revealing police brutality against Saul Satyagrahis were intercepted, but only few were detained and few were allowed to go. On 22nd April 1930, a telegram sent by Bombay Provincial Congress Committee to Gandhi and Motilal Nehru was detained. As you could see, uh, as you also can read the highlighted lines, uh, 300 police attacked volunteers brutally for half an hour. Continuously, volunteers strangled hair, pulled till blood came out, kicked at testicles. This information was shared via press telegrams across India and they were detained for being alarmist in nature. But the news got shared to the Bombay Chronicle newspaper and on 23rd April, and the next day, it got published as a front page news item. Now, when we are talking about surveillance or press telegrams, we can't ignore or miss out the wartime press censorship. During the Second World War, the British needed not just the material resources, but also the public support and opinion. However, the activities which turned, uh, activities which they felt were threatened of, as the messages uh, of law and order in India, administration were considered impeding their goal of to attain the public order, public support and opinion were intercepted. The British government adopted a wartime press censorship policy. Through press censorship policy, the press censorship policy was rigorously, rigorously employed, but it was carried out with caution and a sense of fear. If both sender and receiver realized such action, it would lead to an outcry by the press. Though what time censorship was justified for military purpose, but it got extended over vast spectrum of political matters as quick India movement commenced during this time. I will just highlight one instance. Uh, so here is a press telegram sent by London correspondent named Leonard Matters to the Hindu uh, in June 1941. It was Concerned with treatment of prisoners in India, and it came under scrutiny of Indian censor, who deleted parts of message and altered it. As you could see, the red line, blue blue line, uh, just deleting and making changes. Now, I will conclude by saying few words. The colonial state exercised the surveillance noises primarily to impede and curtail the flow of information via telegraph signals by withholding, delaying and censoring telegrams. I have shown numerous episodes when the colonial state employed these noises in the late colonial India. They reflect their anxiety and fear and panic to preserve their autocracy 
uh, besides ongoing conciliation. Though British were in the process of giving self government, but the progress was gradual. Uh, during this interim period, they retained their control by employing the surveillance noises. So the telegraph surveillance therefore served as a viable tool to control, manage, block telegraph signals, vigorously carrying out political activities and political ambition aiming to attain self-government. And with this, I will stop here. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Dr. PM, for your talk. It was really interesting to listen to telephone and telegraphic surveillance during the colonial period. But you are narrating it so nicely that uh, I was uh, feeling like we still are carrying that legacy of telephone and telegraphic surveillance. Uh, in our era too, when all authorities suspend the internet and the other communications when something happens in our states. So with this, uh, I will open the floor for our discussion. And if any questions you have, please, uh, Dr. P. Arun is here to answer that. Questions on the Zoom, put it on the chat. Uh, we, we, we have also online participation, so I request online participants to send your questions also, please. Thank you, Arun. That was uh, very insightful. Um, and um, I, I was uh, curious for one thing. Uh, I think in, and, and forgive me, I think I missed that a bit. But uh, in one of your initial slides, you uh, mentioned how um, the telegraph uh, network um, increased drastically uh, in the la late 19th century decades. Uh, but in your presentation, you mainly focused on the 20th century. So I was wondering if, uh, one, if you had a reason for focusing on 20th century decades. And also, in case you have studied the late 19th century, what was happening in terms of uh, anti-colonial resistance and telegrams, and uh, was the uh, history of colonial surveillance not uh, relevant to the to those late 19th century decades when the telegram was expanding as, as usual? Thank you.
Thanks, Mumtaz, for mentioning about internet shut down. Uh, and also connected to Professor Vishnu's question. Uh, this is Indian Telegraph Act. It still exists. That law I am talking, it's not just a colonial act which is no more. No more. It still exists and it's the same law which is also used to shut down the internet. The telegraph rules were, the source of the power is Indian Telegraph Act and the rules were laid out recently in 2012. So the power is still the same, the section 5 prohibiting telegrams. So the telegrams also means internet communications. So, so this is the vast kind of definition which we follow. Uh, and presently the government is aiming to uh, amend this law as uh, Indian telecommunication bill which is pending right now. In the coming decades, uh, in coming uh, years, you will see what, not just years, months, the, the, the changes might be visible. Uh, uh, let's start with the question, uh, how do I understand the uh, surveillance prevalent today? Uh, I hardly find a difference because the kind of powers the Telegraph, Indian Telegraph Act offers to the state the post-colonial state never wanted to give away this and it was, it found it legitimate within the democratic framework which is quite uh, uh, boggling as how it is possible as uh, it is only the executive which authorizes surveillance and the executive which uh, oversees them. When I am saying overseas, Across other countries, as Vishnu has mentioned, we have, what is the use of look, looking comparatively other countries? So in America and Britain, they have abandoned the system of only executive authorizing surveillance. Rather, they said that executive can seek surveillance order and the judiciary would authorize. They will constantly oversee their actions, whether it is legitimate or not. And there will be remedies. If I felt that I was uh, unlawfully being kept under surveillance. Now, in India, the colonial legacy still continues. This law still continues the kind of language. And I think we, we really don't understand the language it carries as how it was used to uh, curtail the communi telegraph communication at that time is still being continued even today. Uh, it was quite strange that during constitution making process, right to privacy was not part of it. Uh, this law would have had some limitation at that time uh, but right to privacy became a fundamental right in this uh, uh, in post-colonial India recently in the Puttaswami judgment uh, right to privacy became a fundamental right but it will take uh, more time I believe compared to other countries America and Britain adopting uh, judicial oversight over surveillance although it is not that once we got judicial oversight everything is fine there are issues over that also but India is still quite far away from these kind of developments happening in other countries. So, and there is a uh, case pending in court challenging these powers, Telegraph Act and Information Technology Act. Right? Uh, then uh, if I look uh, comparatively of, of what uh, Professor Vishnu said, in India we have the Indian Telegraph Act. In Britain, there was no law which gives the legal sanction to the British intelligence or law enforcement agencies at that time. So in England, which talks about, uh, 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 which is the origins of the law, where they never had any statute which clearly mentioned about this power. Rather, they said that executive adopted this power. When it comes to call Indian, uh, this, uh, India, they have clearly inscribed this power to intercept. So it took a lot of time. So it was in 1960s, the Britain finally made their law on surveillance, clearly mentioning, okay, these are the powers and these are the limitations. But here we find in Indian colony, it was an exception. And we are exception to the state to carry out surveillance without any kind of restraints. And it still continues even today. Uh, let's go to the first question asked by Sayori. Uh, how telegraph network work during initial phase and why I am focusing only on the late colonial India. Uh, one of the reasons which really pushed me to look into late colonial India was the active phase of freedom movement. I am not saying before that there was no active phase, uh, but the kind of in number of uh, messages, the frequency which we see got really increased. 
Uh, although I am very interested into uh, looking even before going even uh, during the 19th century when the Telegraph Act was introduced. I am also interested into. I hope once I get access into those archives, I will look into it. But in terms of scope, it really becomes huge uh, uh, working on that. Uh, so that's that was a major reason why I focused on just looking into the one particular phase to, uh, uh, to bring nuance analysis of what. Uh, what was happening, how powers were being used, and what was the reaction to those powers. Thank you. Um, thank you for that uh, presentation. Uh, um, I, I was interested in the slide you presented, if you could go to the comparison of uh, what was left uh, to pass and what wasn't. Data that you have here, and what sort of analysis did you yes. say something about it? But if you could draw it out, yes. Uh, I was just looking into these messages again and again. It took two, three days. I, I felt that how you can allow certain messages and uh, detain certain messages. So I felt that once the messages, the, the messages related to the British authorities, they being attacked, uh, the brutality committed over them. The, this was just allegation. I am not saying it was proved by any committee or not because this was an initial time. Uh, rumors happened, so many things happened. But they control. They allowed the messages. Just look at the, the fourth one. The order dispersed unheeded mob proceeding attack police station. Alas, telegraph office cutting wires. But on the other hand, the reaction, the other news, the last one. If you see, Peshawar riots casualties estimated 30 killed. 550 wounded, three more congressmen arrested. Stop. Stop means this is a gap. This we don't use full stop in the Dead Dead bodies of 12 Muslims, five Hindus carried in huge procession. Situation situation still tense. So when the people are giving uh, in uh, the narrative of what happened over there, whether there was any killing of people being killed, they didn't reveal that information. So they never allowed that. So they retained these kind of messages. When you see other side, uh, the brutality committed by people and the crowds, they were allowed to go. Also, killing, killing of the European police. Yes. Bru brutality committed over the Europeans. Can I? Yeah. So, to me, that, that is fascinating. It sounds the work I look at looks at granular, uh, yes. qualitative comparison. Yes. So there's more here. I think there is a pattern you could mm. actually yeah, look at in terms of drawing it out precisely on these lines, coordinate and theme, you know, thematic analysis looks very fascinating. So there's much more that will support you. Yeah. And the more we spend on reading these telegrams again and again, we derive more value. Yeah. Like the, the recovery of four to five books about state anxieties, right? Can you can go yeah. back to that slide? Yeah, so what captures my attention is sovereign anxiety yes. in the timeline. And there is, I can see clearly, like eight years after independence. Mm. So, how those years after independence are still connected to probably surveillance over, over telegraph messages. How is that, like, why is that happening? The second question probably that has a very straight answer. I'm thinking about prisoners in poor play, and then there the known actors against British state were supposed to be kept in confinement. Are there also instances there telegraph from those people at Port Blair who were prisoners were also censored? So that's all. Uh, so one of the uh, uh, 
official document I uh, read. Uh, there were questions what to do once uh, so many telegraph messages were flowing. The authorities were uh, doubtful what to do. So they have this power, they didn't abolish it. So they have suddenly this power, what to do, so many messages were flowing. So the reason was that we should intercept if we feel th these are really disturbing in nature. Uh, I think there are this much more I can look what happened just uh, as we got independence. Uh, so Jagir Iqbal Wani's work is something really fascinating to look in terms of different time phases. So in post-colonial India, once we have got the constitution, uh, the freedoms were recognized. There were restraints over this, uh, the power of the state. Uh, did it really play any major role in curbing the kind of powers they are using uh, under this telegraph act? So I think I could look more into it. Uh, and then your suggestion on prisoners in Port Blair, I am not much aware of it. Uh, so sorry for that. Yeah, uh, so if I think like there was assassination of Gandhi Definition? and assassination, of, assassination Gandhi, of Gandhi post independence, and also India saw a great uh, human, uh, I would say, massacred post independence because of migration from India to Pakistan and Pakistan to India. So that was a period of upheaval. Yes. And, and then there was question about the activities of probably RSS. They might, so such an event might have communicated through telegraph. They were also part of, of these sovereign anxieties post independence. Uh, looking into the specific of each event would be really interesting. Like, we need to have uh, going to different places and need to find those particular uh, archives. What the telegraph authorities were doing. Which kind of messages they were they had with him? They were really disturbed or not? So looking into home department and telegraph authorities archives, I believe that in any every moment, as you mentioned, partition and assassination of Gandhi. So we can take different moments and we can bring uh, larger pictures what happened. Not just us. I will say the radicals, uh, the communists. If we go into each member and if we are able to uh, bring to the narrative of how they were constantly moving across different countries, how they were communicating. If they were communicating, obviously through telegraph or any other means, whether it was intercepted or not. Uh, so that will be a fascinating study to look into it. Uh, I didn't go into, into, into that direction much. Uh, this is as an increasing uh, scope. That's, yeah. Yes. So this is going to be following thematic analysis question. Right? Yes. But I'm more interested in what sort of guidelines or manuals yes. given out to the individual telegram offices at let's say at each telegram station. Uh, what sort of words were framed as censored, not allowed, to be retained? Was there any pattern to that one? And uh, are you familiar with the recent day surveillance to the DRDO and uh, this is one central monitoring authority in India and Delhi which uses. It also is also very similar to this system of uh, flagging out keywords and key phrases. Okay. So do you see a continuity there? Uh, at least the recent ones are still not available in uh, public knowledge, but some are in forms of court statements and uh, public uh, statements from parliament authorities. Uh, do you see a continuity in the use of language or the framing that seems to be problematic? And especially in the post-1990 era, what do you see, especially the post-Twin uh, uh, Tower blast and so Twin Tower incident and uh, American war on terrorism, do you see this taking a much broader shape where we move away from words, text to much more multimodal surveillance uh, in terms of CCTV, in terms of facial recognition, those are all coming. Because one of the interesting facts is Delhi and Chennai, in fact Chennai more than Delhi, is supposed to have more CCTV cameras than many cities in China. So, so just curious. So this is also the, uh, coming out from the Telegram Act in 1885. So how do you see the sort of expansion of surveillance regime in these new states or in these post-colonial states? Uh, the first um, guidelines. Uh, uh, I was able to access few guidelines. So Telegraph authorities were very uh, confused what to do with the Telegram if they received. They felt were objectionable. 
So one thing is they uh, with, with their discretion they could just withheld, withhold that message. But if they felt that okay they can't make that decision, they have the authority to send that uh, telegram to civil and military authorities. If it, it was about diplomacy, how a telegraph authority at that local level can make that decision? So those messages reach the, the authorities who are who can make that decision. So this was uh, uh, largely uh, the guidelines, uh, but there there are those always errors. It's not that it's a perfect system. They usually made errors. So one of the instances, uh, Gandhi arrest information relating to Gandhi's arrest was to be intercepted. Uh, but they intercepted every message related to Darshana's rape. So it was uh, uh, so surveillance order was on intercepting. Gandhi's messages relating to Darshana's aid, but they intercepted every message communicated about Darshana's aid. So this very nuance of that message, the surveillance order, which the authorities could not uh, distinguish. And later, the official responded back saying that, so you are doing something wrong, you should stop this. Okay. Uh, there sometimes what happened is surveillance order is brief. So uh, when we are talking about surveillance, there is a law in India. I am not talking about in Britain where there is no law. They can do it continuously, unlimited amount of time period. But in India, they have they made a law. They there is a law they need to follow. So they have to do give a surveillance order. Surveillance order prescribes a particular time period around which they have to carry out. Sometimes in Motilal Nehru's telegram, when they were intercepted, they carried out for a lar larger amount of time period, not just two months, but more than bit beyond that. So they are questioning it, why the officials did this, what was the reasons. So these are the, uh, the issues. Also with regard to, uh, there are different laws. As I have mentioned, it's not just Indian Telegraph Act. We had Indian Telegraph rules and also uh, Defense of India rules. Uh, it was during wartime only where we see censorship, altering messages, paraphrasing messages, which, which is very difficult. You can't alter a message, it will kill the message what the censor, the, the officials also said. But they said that you have to be very careful. If you alter a message, you could just uh, change the meaning and people will get to know. So it was very difficult to give certain kind of guidelines to officials as what to do in terms of censorship and how to follow the authority and all. Because it would reveal, get revealed in the public and then there was a huge uh, public outcry. Even that press telegram, the last one I have mentioned. So guideline, although they were clearly mentioning what to do, but people need to interpret. When the telegram comes, they have to make that decision what the action need to be taken. The second question with regard to the expansion of surveillance post 1919, the present one, uh, I say that I will say that the logic, uh, the rationale, it's the same. It's discriminative targeting, indiscriminately targeting through keywords, link, identifying the links and connections of the people. Right now we have the, the same Telegraph Act along with the Information Technology Act. It allows the government to look the links through your phone. So your phone, you, we are constantly connect, calling people. So we can bring the gold data analysis as to whom we are linked. So most of the Bhima Kuregaon case and Delhi police riots cases, uh, they are related to this. You are linked to that person. Now you have to prove you are not uh, accused. Uh, it, it's not limited to communication. Right now we have the sentimental analysis of social media looking into broad region. Our presence over digital space is, has got increased. Uh, the larger theme right now, what we didn't find during that time in the, the language of terrorism. Although emergency which right now, which the new language which, which we have created. So this is a new language across everything. The people, those who are communicating, this language allows them, the, the word of uh, emergency because there is a terrorist threat. This allows them to use the kind of laws we have to justify surveillance even today. And different kinds of surveillance which are emerging every day are being justified under these grounds. Yeah, uh, I also 
I was curious in case you have come across in your archival research any um, uh, question, uh, and this has uh, to do with the telegram uh, workers. Uh, I'm assuming there would be a lot of Indians. Are there any incidents of subversion or say labor strikes or resistance from within the system? Yes. Uh, Nikhil Chaudhary's work, uh, the telegraph imperialism. So he briefly mentioned about telegraph uh, workers uh, protesting. So Indians are telegraph workers. Just imagine the message they have is and they don't fo follow the order. Or they were engaged in a telegraph protest and they are sending using the telegraph channels to communicate that we are going to unite and all. So he did talk about one of this movement. But if you look at Telegraph uh, Workers Union and all, that is a very interesting, fascinating study. There were studies in Britain and America, but in India, we still need to go into that aspect, as you have mentioned. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Something uh, we look at in psychology is how do you create a, a culture of consensus of fear or understanding where the leader doesn't have to really set out the, um, they don't have to clearly articulate what is to be done. They sort of give you a template and it's up to the followers who are a part of that culture who have been, you know, um, are to understand what those dog whistles are and to follow it through. So there is that, that the, the infamous study is Milgram's study, where we, Milgram's study, okay. where we talk about studies of obedience, but our interpretation of that is this, that the leader actually just gives you a template. The followers interpret it towards it, but that interpretation is usually followed through a culture of what is it that you're supposed to interpret. Yes. So that gives them plausible deniability. Yes. So, of course. Our leader doesn't know anything. Yeah, this is a little ugly, but uh, the British also, during, like, during World War One, they, of, they, of, they had a huge amount of surveillance going on because they, they were the center of the telegraph network across yes. the Atlantic. They had a separate huge number of German communications yes. which were traveling across yes. the Zimmer telegram. And yes, the telegram. Yes. The one problem they had was actually acting on that information because of the amount of time it takes to collect this huge amount of data. How effective were they in India? How much, how large was the system of surveillance that they had built up here to try and read all these telegrams? Because it's not just famous people who they can identify, like not these operating fighters, it's normal people also send telegrams across. How did they deal with that huge volume of data? Uh, to statistically give an answer, I don't have that number of telegrams because this is a into the intercepted uh, telegrams which I was able to access. Just imagine uh, under telegraph rules, the telegraph authorities can just refuse. So it never reached the, the, the officials. So the telegrams I accessed was there were questions whether it needs to be sent or not. So civil and uh, military authorities were, made, were supposed to make that decision. So government said they have sent a telegram so this is objectionable, you have to make a decision. It, already it was within, they are holding that message. They have, they made a decision, okay, let's allow this. So I, the, one of the limitations to bring that kind of how effective it is, uh, possibly it is to look through the message which is being sent and the kind of consequences uh, it had. Did, did it really made an impact? Were they able to uh, send the news in terms of, during Jalianwala back, I believe that it was really effective, not just uh, censorship, physically not allowing any person to move beyond the Jalian Malaba, really didn't allow many people. It was a year later people say that we really got the picture about what happened in Jalian Malaba. So in, I think that statistical figures would be difficult, but we can infer through looking through messages and try to understand what happened during that instance, during that moment of particular strike.
principles yes. were in that to the archives of that yes, right. and so on. You could see that what people are doing, what police are actually assessing right. on the ground what is happening. Yes. They say Gandhi has become very popular. Yes. They, they say but there's some are actionable, but some are not necessarily actionable. Some are statement about what is going on. Mm. The overall uh, the more the mood and sometimes capturing the mood, capturing not that they can, not that they're not actionable the way we are thinking in an immediate sense. Yes. Unless there's a real violence. Yes. Unless there's something is about to happen mm -hmm. that you go. And so the question that I had was that now that you have a lot of stakes are interested in surveillance, yes. and particularly in the kind of global networks, mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think uh, there was a sharing of these information? During the colonial period, and, and now to jump to we, we have a lot of sharing that happens among the intelligence agencies across states. Yes, they, they're not really keeping the information themselves. Yes, and also sharing, and there's uh, the protocols. Are, I'm not very sure, but but there are protocols by which messages are coming across yes. uh, the national boundaries. Yes, uh, intelligence agencies yes. and so on, pushing on information to other people because they. they because the information highway is quite entangled uh, in the contemporary times. Would you say that? Do you, do you find anything like that? Uh, uh, let's first finish the contemporary thing. So in Europe, uh, uh, there's a huge issue. post modern it got revealed that countries are sharing information with each other, law enforcement agencies, intelligence agencies. Uh, this got challenged in Europe. The cases are still going. Uh, it is justified lawfully in Europe that you people, uh, the countries can share information, but they narrowed it in term. They, it should be limited when there is a serious uh, national emergency or matters related to that. Uh, uh, then there is of child trafficking. So there are different. Uh, as you mentioned, what is post uh, 1990? So we have new kind of issues: child trafficking and uh, child pornography, the information related to the, looking into the text, images and all. So sharing information is justified right now in this uh, intelligence, by the intelligence agencies. But when we come to the colonies, uh, one of the most common thing is uh, the British state would share information to the government of India that see this, these kind of uh, uh, radicals are there in Britain, uh, even the Germans and uh, the French state, they were also sharing information. So there is an interesting study policing the state. Uh, once, uh, so the author, Daniel Brokenheim, so he looks into the archives of three different countries and sees how the information was being shared uh, across different people about uh, Indian radicals going across. Not, they are not just in Britain, rather they go across in different places. And uh, so, they, there is the practice of sharing information even during that time about the person, whether he exists here, about the, when he left. So these are kind of, and even constantly looking at telegrams and seeing whether there is any information being shared. So uh, it did exist even that day also. Yeah, So with this, we shall end up today's talk, and uh, with the hope that we meet again on 29th of November. I thank you again, Dr. P. Arun, for your uh, brilliant talk, and it is such a vast subject to discuss, and I wish you all the very best for your future research. Thank you.